Thanks for tuning into The Scoop. I hope we can continue to serve as an important source of information and entertainment during these unprecedented times. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Bitstamp, before we get started with the episode. They're the original global cryptocurrency exchange. Since 2011, Bitstamp has been a cornerstone of the cryptocurrency industry and the preferred exchange for serious traders and investors, trusted by over 4 million customers, including top financial institutions. Bitstamp is built on professional grade trading technology. Their platform is powered by a matching engine from NASDAQ, the global stock exchange, and their APIs are consistently recognized as the best in the industry. Bitstamp's advanced trading interface, TradeView, features live charting, deep analytical tools, and is available on web and mobile. You can download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and to start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited for this special Paul Tudor Jones edition of The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block. And on the other side of the mic today is the inimitable Mike Novogratz, founder of Galaxy Digital, the crypto merchant bank. Novo, we, we want to be respectful of your time, so we'll dive right into the meat of this. Yesterday, a note by famed hedge funder Paul Tudor Jones dropped, and it sent shockwaves throughout the cryptocurrency community. The letter, the gist of the letter, for those of you who are maybe hiding under a rock somewhere, is pretty straightforward. Jones sees Bitcoin as a inflationary hedge against money printing. The almost unabated central bank money printing we've seen over the past few months as coronavirus has gripped global markets, and it might allocate to Bitcoin futures. My first question, Mike, How would you quantify the significance of this? You have a lot of people on Twitter, a lot of crypto pontificators and pundits saying that this is just a hedge. He's not speculatively long Bitcoin. He doesn't see it as a systematic hedge, nor in his words, he's not a crypto nut. So is this significant? I think it's wildly significant. And let me tell you why. First of all, Paul is a friend. Uh, He's been a mentor and he is certainly one of the three kind of lords of macro. You know, you can put them up there with Stan Druckenmiller and, and Louis Bacon as really the, the three amigos who have dominated the macro, you know, investing space for over 25 years. And so, you know, people always give me nice accolades. I was always the second, you know, I was always the second level. and uh, I never made it to their, uh, to that status, uh, to be completely frank. And I did run a $10 billion hedge fund. I mean, those guys have done it and done it consistently. And so when Paul Jones says, I'm putting Bitcoin in my fund, it's a significant, significant gesture. I, one, it makes anyone else who wants to do it, you know, the career risk of looking stupid because you bought Bitcoin is now limit down, right? A lot of people don't want to be the first mover in something because, God, if it goes wrong and I put Bitcoin in my hedge fund, I look like an idiot. Well, also, Paul Jones just put Bitcoin in his hedge fund. You can too. And so I think it opens up a new universe of buyers for crypto. Listen, there have been some hedge funds that have been doing the the Grayscale arbitrage. You know, you've read about it in the paper. And so Grayscale has been raising money in their fund. They get hedge funds to put in Bitcoin. They season it and sell it to retail, right? That's been a beautiful business for Barry Silver and hedge funds have made a lot of money. There's about a 30% premium on the Bitcoin side, about 400 we've seen on the ETH side. So big money making opportunity. Yeah. And so beautiful business for the arbitragers. But this time it's a macro hedge fund saying Bitcoin is a investable asset and it's a macro weapon in the same way tips could be or yield curve could be or, you know, treasuries, uh, currencies. Bitcoin is now just a macro weapon. And that's a big, big deal. But do you think the fact that they're investing or set to invest in Bitcoin futures not the underlying spot Bitcoin itself makes a difference in this narrative of institutions moving in. Hey, the first thing I would tell you is having run a macro hedge fund, most macro managers that are, you know, big and well, well resourced and bright, look at every single weapon you could get your exposure on. So when I trade treasuries, I look at futures, I look at cash, I look at swaps if I'm trying to make an interest rate bet, right? And so I think people 
shouldn't uh, be so sh sure they know how a hedge fund is playing crypto. Uh, I would kind of leave it at that, right? That this quick assumption that this is the way he's doing it, it's only in futures. And, uh, you know, all macro funds are pretty, uh, pretty agile. And so, and quite frankly, it doesn't really make that big of a difference because the concept of your investors saying, hey, you made a bet on, you know, crypto, that's the sale you made. This is why I'm doing it because I believe Bitcoin is a store of value. And, you know, the Bitcoin narrative is all store of value right now, right? And so I was going to ask, I was going to ask Ray Dalio this question if I bump into him. At what point would you agree that Bitcoin is a store of value? How many people have to believe that it is? How many, you know, names like Bill Miller and Jack Dorsey and now Paul Jones and Pete Brigger and Wences Casares and Mickey Melker. I mean, these are all billionaires that have made huge, huge fortunes in other in non-crypto businesses, right? And Mickey's the best fintech investor in the world right now. Bill Miller was probably the best fintech, uh, you know, financials investor ever, you know, in the public markets, right? Abby Johnson runs one of the biggest and most respected, you know, shops, you know, for what, 80 years. And so like, at what point does Bitcoin get credentialized that it's just a store of value and you'd be willing to play it? Because that's all gold is, right? Gold's, gold's got 2,500 years. No one questions that it, it's a it's a fair asset to buy and sell and hold as a store of value. And so I think, listen, this just accelerates that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pivotal moment. I mean, it's helping large investors get over that original headline risk of being associated with magic Internet money. And I would tell you that there are at least five or six other stunningly good investors that I know of that have bought significant positions for themselves, not in their funds yet, but for themselves. Now, they haven't gone public and, and, you know, it's not my job to make them public. Some have done them in futures, CME futures. Some have done them just, you know, in cash. They set up a, some do it on, you know, they set up a custody account at either Bact or Fidelity or New York Dig. And that business, that the, the activity in that space is picking up immensely. So I guess that that leads to a very interesting question, which is if they're sort of trading out of their PAs, and and maybe not doing so publicly, what's keeping them from doing it, you know, on their corporate accounts? Is it the fact that in many cases funds don't have the mandate to buy spot Bitcoin or they don't have the technical expertise to buy spot Bitcoin? Um, and when do we get to that point? It's a little listen, Bitcoin's a pain in the ass to buy. It still is. I mean, you know, I always tell people one of the reasons there is a a great opportunity to buy it down here because if it was really easy, the price would be a lot higher right? We are all in the business of building on ramps for people to be able to buy Bitcoin, but banks don't make it easy, right? Banks still don't give crypto companies, you know, bank accounts. They are, they're protecting their turf. So even when Calibra, you know, a fully owned subsidiary of, of Facebook was getting set up, it couldn't get a goddamn bank account. <laughs> Think about that, right? And so there has been it's a, it's a headache. I call these guys. And I'm like, well, like, listen, we have a Bitcoin fund now and it's a really simple Bitcoin fund, right? It's custody that near at backed or, or fidelity. We buy Bitcoin uh, and we hold it for you. There's nothing really much to it. Um, Are you seeing subscriptions on that pickup given the broader macro picture? We just have. Listen, the, our business plan on that is relatively simple. We want to connect into the giant pool of what I call 50 to 80 year old money, which is managed by registered investment advisors. So we're working at distribution platforms to, you know, we're not going to, we're not a retail shop where we're going to, you know, smile and dial and call for small checks or have a, or, or have a platform for small checks. And so, and we're not going to hire, you know, 200 salesmen. And so we're working on our distribution partnerships right now. Uh, but, you know, five weeks in a row of inflows or eight weeks in a row of inflows, uh, they're picking up bigger, bigger tickets, bigger amounts. So you tell, tell someone, listen, you can buy Bitcoin. We, we have an OTC desk. You can buy it and you can custody it. We'll, we'll help you, you know, custody it somewhere. That's a pretty simple way. But even that you got, you know, it's just not as easy as them picking up their phone to Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or Citibank and say, hey, I want to buy Bitcoin. And so for hedge funds, they got to do extra due diligence on where is it being custody and is it safe? And I don't want to look stupid. This will just accelerate it, right? As Bitcoin, Bitcoin is going to go higher. 
And as it goes higher, people are like, oh, wait a minute. Now I might look like, what am I missing? And so it was really important that Paul bought it, but it was more important that he actually was public that he bought it. One thing I've been really tried to do to the Bitcoin, what, as we you know, try to get people involved in the community, it's what's unique about this. And I learned this really originally from um, Alex Marcos, right? Who's one of the, my favorite guys in the whole Bitcoin community, right? And, and I was like, Alex, you're like damn Robin Hood of Bitcoin. He, if you don't know Alex, he, you know, used to run uh, Hudson River Trading, you know, one of the, at one point I think 8% of all the volume on the New York Stock Exchange. And he decided to, to leave that and throw his life into Bitcoin. And, you know, he's a, a coder, you know, that, you know, like in the, in the, the, the secret temples that keep the Bitcoin code uh, and you try to make changes and uh, core developer, right? And he set up a shop to do it. He, he ran the MIT experiment where he gave every kid at MIT a Bitcoin. He's been wonderfully phil philanthropic in the Bitcoin regulatory stuff and in the community, a smart thinker. And I was like, man, you're like Robin Hood. And he looked at me and he said, dude, I own a whole lot of Bitcoin. So I've got a vested interest for the community to be a good one and for people to believe in it. And so, and I was like, wow, crypto in general, you do well by doing good. And so as you know, I mean, I do a whole lot of TV. My teammates say that's because you like, you know, you have such a big ego, you like being on TV. And I was like, well, maybe that's true, but I don't think it is. You know, I have a vest, I have a vested interest because I own a lot of Bitcoin or our firm owns a lot of Bitcoin to get people to believe the story, to understand the story, to see why I think Bitcoin's uh, significant, at least as part of a portfolio, even if they don't buy it through us. And quite frankly, most people that I meet and talk to don't buy it through us, right? But Mike, that's a really good point because if you look at the stock price of Galaxy Digital just yesterday and today, I mean, today we're up 6%. You know, it, it struggled for the better part of the company's history since IPO and has traded below book value. But now, I mean, since March 17th, we're up well over 140%. So I think to your point, yes, maybe they're not trading through your OTC desk. Maybe they're not buying into your funds. But at the end of the day, these headline watershed moments are going to play well for galaxy how do you how do you capitalize on that and sort of translate that momentum into into revenue i had a phone call you know last night with a few of my senior guys i was like guys you know we had a bit we had a plan you know up until about a day ago and i was like you know what we need to accelerate on multiple fronts because i think there's going to be this window of opportunity where you're going to see people rush into crypto and I, I need bigger funnels in my asset management business to get money into our asset management product. I mean, listen, to be honest, it's been a brutal struggle building the business uh, for everybody in the space. You know, Barry really, you know, is the only guy that cracked the code to get any real assets under management in the asset management side with the with the trust structure that he did. It, it's not. Usually when you see someone doing something well, you just copy it, but he's got a moat around it because you will get, you won't be able to get a license to do it. And so the, the, the other asset management businesses, if it was Pantera's Bitcoin fund or Bitwise's, you know, funds, no one really raised a whole lot of asset. It's been difficult. I think that's going to change. Same thing in the OTC trading business, right? The OTC trading business was really good in 2017 before we got in it, right? DRW, you know, Barry shop making lots of money. And then in 18, when the market collapsed and there was ex excess capacity, right? Volumes went down, uh, less coins traded. Uh, spreads tightened. Coins traded and spreads have tightened, right? So now you're trading Bitcoin and hoping to make six to eight basis points. And so the institutional, you know, Galaxy was set up to be this bridge between crypto and the institutional world. That wasn't a great bet. We went, you know, for the last, for the first two and a half years. A far better bet was just to stay in retail and the platform businesses, businesses like BlockFi, lending, you know, the scalable platform businesses or, you know, the, the exchanges, the wallets, because Bitcoin continued and remained a young people's and, and a, a retail business. And I think maybe now we're now just seeing the shift where institutions and it's partly both institutions, but it's partially age to go from the younger generation, you know, from Gen Z and millennials to the boomers, right? The boomers have all the money. 
and they don't invest the same way Gen Z and millennials. They, they don't have a square app. They don't do Robinhood. And so I think now there's a chance that both professional Wall Street's going to come in and that that boomer generation is going to come in through their registered investment advisors. You're going to see, you know, two new on ramps into Bitcoin and other crypto, and you're going to see prices go much higher. What's so crazy to me is the fact when you think of how large Paul Tudor Jones's fund is, we're talking, I think the latest numbers were $10 billion, right? That's a sizable fraction of the entire Bitcoin market cap. I want to take a minute to step back and go to the letter. At the heart of this letter is really the notion, right, that we're witnessing this great monetary inflation. Global debt is spiking. Money printing is happening unabated. And this story was playing out prior to the pandemic. So how do you see that playing out? Are we heading into a deflationary environment or an inflationary environment? If you're a macro guy, you've had a whole lot of these arguments back and forth for the last 15 years, really, even pre-COVID, and now it's really accelerated. I think the best insight of Paul's letter is when he talks about coming out of 08 and we had the uh, the Tea Party that really said, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to put some handcuffs around fiscal, right? It's one of the reasons all the pressure was always on Bernanke to try to get the economy, you know, going above that 2% growth that people were, were frustrated with is that you had this very aggressive foil in the Republican Tea Party. And this time it's different. This time, COVID has exposed the rich, poor gap like, like never before. And we already had the rise of populism. I mean, if I could buy calls on Alexandria, you know, uh, Cortez, you know, AOC, I would, right? She's smart, she's dynamic, and she is touching that nerve of populism. And so I think what Paul's bet is, is that the probability that we have rampant spending for a while that nobody clamps down on it is a lot higher than it used to be, right? And so we are gonna get hit with a deflationary shockwave. I mean, that's just, we got 20% unemployment. We, you know, I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of the park on the West Side Highway here in Manhattan. And we had our board meeting last night and it's like every organization, okay, you gotta cut your spending. We're gonna have less flowers. You gotta cut because your revenue is coming down because we get rents from people that, you know, use parts of the park. And, that whole cycle is coming to every county, city, state, business that's deflationary. And so the first shock is deflationary. Uh, markets like to look forward and, you know, we already are spending. One of the great statistics I've come up with in the last few months is 2020 disposable income in the United States looks like it's going to be higher than 2019. That almost seems insane. Right? Why? Because right now, if you were one of the 5 million workers in America that work at big box retail, that's Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, any of those places, there's 5 million people that work there. 85% make less than the living wage. The living wage in America is $16 an hour. That's average of all the different counties. The average big box worker works make $13 an hour. The average worker at quick service restaurants, right? McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, they make $13 an hour. Right now, if you're on unemployment through July, you're getting 600 from the feds, 400 from your state. So you're at $25 an hour. And that's before the $1,200 stimulus check. And so we're pumping out a lot of money into the consumer's hand. And those consumers, you know, unfortunately, when you're poor, you don't, you know, You've got no discretionary room and all of a sudden you're feeling less poor in some bizarre way right now. And so I think people are saying, geez, that feels like a more fair wage than the old one. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it does in some ways, right? Inflation you know? is a relation. Inflation is a relation. And so all of a sudden there's going to be a lot of stress. You watch in July how much fight there is to, to keep the $600 extra going. And listen, we can't pay people forever because, you know, if you think about the size of our budget, roughly we have a $20 trillion economy and a quarter of it, you know, 20% is supposed to be the federal budget historically. And so, you know, you got four to 5 trillion and, you know, we're, we're feeling pretty good at 2 trillion for two months, you know, and I think it's going to be hard to get that genie back in the bottle. 
And I think that's what Paul's talking about, that the, not that it's going to happen, but the possibility and the probability of really populist fiscal, which is monetized by a central bank, uh, is much higher than it was before this. And so when you're thinking about invest, I always tell people one to two percent of your portfolio in Bitcoin or in crypto, it's optionality that that possibility is growing. And when we go through events like we just went through or we're going through, you know, when we went through 1997 in Asia, I was at the financial crisis and, you know, the great Asian financial crisis. And then you had 98 with the long term capital management. And each of the times you learn that when really weird stuff happens, things that you used to hold sacred no longer are sacred, right? Swap spreads in 08 went negative. No one thought they could go negative. Then they went negative 80 basis points in the long run. And they're like, okay, I got it. Oil trading negative. Like no one thought that was possible. And now, well, could people lose faith in the dollar? No one thinks that's possible. I mean, I remember talking to Secretary Mnuchin Christmas time for the Goldman Sachs Retired Partners Dinner. And I was trying to talk a lot about the Chinese, you know, renminbi cryptocurrency that's coming in. Uh, his view was like, no one really wants to own the Chinese currency. They all want to own the dollars. And I kind of agree with him. But the possibility that the dollar loses its reserve status is a lot higher today than it was when I talked to him in Christmas. And I think the argument why every portfolio needs crypto is that we're in a world where we're playing with numbers we've never seen before. We've never had 20% unemployment. Uh, Happened so rapidly, at least. I mean, yes. it's striking to me. I mean, the thing about this economic and health crisis is, and it's cliche, but expect the unexpected or don't expect the expected. When you think about the biggest takeaway from this health crisis, and maybe we can harken back on 08, you mentioned that we can't put the Fed genie back in the bottle, but is that the biggest thing that's been exposed or is it that we don't have the infrastructure to pump money into, into Main Street? Is it that our healthcare infrastructure sucks? There's so many different things we can talk about, but what, in your opinion, is the biggest thing this crisis has exposed about the economy, about our political system? It's a loaded question, but I'm sure you have a loaded opinion. Two things. One, we already started with a 5% budget deficit, right? And that was a little bit of Trump wanting to juice the economy and get reelected. We had a 5% budget deficit when we were at full employment, as Trump's at the greatest economy of all time. If it's the greatest economy of all time, we shouldn't have a 5% budget deficit, right? So we were already borrowing from the future at an unsustainable pace. The debt being run up by the baby boomers, and I'm embarrassed, I'm 31 days a baby boomer. If I was just, my parents held off a little longer, I wouldn't have been in that damn shitty generation. But the baby boomer generation will go down as the single most selfish generation. They are running up a debt that their kids and grandkids and great grandkids won't be able to pay back. And we haven't seen that interage frustration. We're seeing rich poor frustration, right? And that's going to explode. And that's what this is exposed. But it's also as people start thinking about it, like, wait a minute, uh, this is an intergenerational theft on a scale that we've never seen before. Uh, and that I think is, is a big deal. Now, listen, how are you going to get out of it? There's only one way to get out of this monster debt that we have, uh, and it's going to be to inflate your way out. of it. And so we're going to have to try. Inflation is coming. It might not be coming in the next two years, but markets look ahead of themselves. You, you just can't make the math work. You know, after 08, Ray Daly did a beautiful piece about it's worth going to find it and rereading it again about kind of graceful exits of these things and, and less graceful exits. That wasn't his exact words, but basically that's what he was saying. And after right, there was a shot and we were pulling it off. The Fed was pulling off a graceful exit. And I think the chance of a graceful exit out of this crisis, given the magnitude that they had to go in with, is a lot, lot less possible. Mike, I appreciate your time, but I have one final question and I I think it's super relevant because we're just a few days away from the having. It's clear that this macro picture to some extent or another is making Bitcoin more appealing, at least to some traditional investors. But there's also the having coming up in a few days. To what degree do you think that that is also playing a role in illustrating Bitcoin's unique fixed supply to these types of investors? Paul Jones notes it in his letter. Bitcoin is literally the only tradable asset in the world that has a known fixed maximum supply. 
By its design, the total quantity of Bitcoins cannot exceed 21 million. How important is the halvening it, as a part of this conversation? The halvening couldn't come at a better time for my story, for this story, right? We've got quantitative easing going on at a pace we've never seen before in central banks around the world. And the happening is really quantitative tightening. And it's that simple. You're like, dudes, they're printing dollars like they're toilet paper. You know, money is growing on trees. And over here in this, you know, new and less comfortable regime, there's deflation going on. We're cutting the inflation rate from 3.4% to 1.7%. You know, there's real scarcity and it's programmed and it can't be changed. And in four more years, it'll get cut again. And, and so it's, it just highlights the differences of the two regimes and it does in a big way. And I think that's, that's important. You know, listen, I think Bitcoin is going up for two reasons. It's going up faster than gold for one reason. It's going up because of this macro story makes it a powerful, it is, it's, it's such a powerful story. People buy into it, but it was going up anyways because of adoption, right? As I said, putting the, the rails in for people to be able to have easier access to it. Listen, when the Calibre wallet opens up, 3 billion people will be able to buy Bitcoin on their wallet, on the, on the Facebook app. That's a huge deal. That's not happening anytime in the next month or so, but Calibra will open with a wallet. They will have stable coins and you will be able to trade your stable coin for a Bitcoin, just like you can on Square or Robinhood. Uh, and so the adoption curve was happening anyways. We had this fun. We were targeting... RIAs, it's just going to accelerate now because the macro story is behind it. And so I think you've got a macro story and you've got accelerated adoption. I couldn't be more bullish. And there we have it, folks. There we have it. Mike Novogratz, founder, CEO of Galaxy Digital, could not be more bullish. Are we going to get a price target? You were talking with Jeremy Allaire yesterday. Did you? I don't. I didn't catch if you gave him one or not. I mean, when you look at the charts, we got to take out ten thousand. And listen, the, 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 I'm sure there'll be some volatility around the happening on whatever Monday night, maybe it'll be a sell the room or you know, buy the room or sell the fact, but they're buyers below. And so I think if it sells off, it goes back higher enough. 14,000 is our first target, but I think we, we finished the year at 20,000 or higher. I really do. And we shall see. How are you spending yeah. the happening? Do you have any special happening plans? <laughs> I haven't thought of it yet, <laughs> but maybe I should. <laughs> Us out some IPAs, get some donuts. Yeah, so I was thinking more Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. That's, that, that'll I'm work. A, All right, Novogratz. I'm, I'm a poor man's drinker. All right. <laughs> so am I. Well, take it easy, Mike. We'll have you on soon and appreciate your insights as always. Thanks so much. Yep. Do well. I'd like to give our sponsor, Bitstamp, a big thank you. The original global cryptocurrency exchange. Bitstamp is built for professional traders, yet intuitive enough for any investor. You can use Bitstamp's advanced trading interface, TradeView, to execute your strategy or instantly buy crypto in seconds when the opportunity strikes, all from your computer or mobile device. Bitstamp prides itself on delivering unmatched customer service with a human touch. Their global customer care team is available around the clock via telephone, email, and social media. When you contact them, you'll always speak to an actual person, not a bot. You can download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and to start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro.